Yeah, EDI was um, uh, an important step to make for the book uh, mm -hmm. and for the field, actually. Um, funnily enough, uh, the field doesn't seem to be uh, quite uh, uh, engaged as much as we might hope. Uh, so recently, uh, 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 Robert, um, a psychologist from, I think, Stanford, uh, wrote um, a paper in 2020 already uh, on the importance of diversity and including um, um, minority minority members uh, more not only in terms of um, uh, staff but also uh, research populations. Recently, I think two or three months ago, uh, or two months ago, uh, there was a whole uproar uh, where uh, a, a uh, decidedly uh, uniform group of older men, <laughs> let's call it this, uh, let's call it uh, uh, this way, uh, decided that no diversity wasn't very important in psychology, uh, especially not in terms of research populations, because we are looking at um, generic human behavior that applies to all humans. It's like uh, doing some research uh, into, let's say, um, pooing on the toilet should be similar for anyone um uh, but um fortunately these uh, these arguments have been uh, uh, waylaid or discounted uh, quite regularly um and the proof is in the pudding if you think that you are looking at fundamental um uh, human behavior or psychology that applies to everyone then the onus is on you uh, it is your task to actually show that that it is a, a fundamental uh, process that you are investigating instead of saying no we can test this on uh, on um, psychology students mostly female and um, because it is it, it applies to all of us I think um, um, the this just illustrates that the field of psychology is still very much struggling with EDI uh, historically as well as contemporary and it's been a, it's been a, uh, not a struggle but um, um, a challenge uh, to incorporate uh, more, you know, the diversity and inclusion, and the uh, uh, the idea that uh, we should incorporate as many um, populations, uh, people in uh, in its broad diversity, which makes us beautiful as humans as well. This diversity uh, in our research and in our science. Uh, because historically we have not. So it's quite difficult to then also incorporate that in a textbook because there is no evidence. So if you're looking at, uh, let's say, um, uh, gender difference in eating disorders, um, then you might want to understand how uh, not only male versus female differences uh, arise in eating disorders, but also the broader spectrum in terms of gender identification. Uh, but there is almost no evidence. So, uh, because yeah, it, uh, typically psychologists have not uh, looked and uh, did not look at it um, with this broader scope um, on this specific type of uh, behavior. Uh, so you might want to incorporate more diverse views in a textbook, but then you immediately have the um, difficulty of um, but you, in a textbook, especially a first year te textbook, you want to incorporate um, evidence, scientific evidence that is undisputed, preferably because this is a first year's textbook. You want to kind of, you know, make small steps, but first make a uh, lay a gr the groundwork for the rest of, of a person's uh, student's uh, career. Um, but with the diversity uh, discussion going on, there is the the, the chance that you uh, weigh evidence um, that is not as well um, researched yet. So it's, it's been difficult. It's been a challenge, a worthwhile challenge. And I think we, um, um, we in the end, did a good job. We had an, an, an excellent uh, uh, diversity officer that helped us um uh raise issues and uh helped uh raise awareness um because we all three of us are so the authors of this uh book the active authors of this book are all white men uh, there is no uh <laughs> denying that 
uh, but with good intentions, let's put it that way. And we hope that we um, uh, have incorporated diversity issues uh, and addressed them more thoroughly in this book. Um, I think there could, there's always more to do, but as I said, for some approaches, there just isn't evidence yet, which in and of itself is good to know. Uh, so at points in the book, we make this point um, that we might want to understand um, the external validity of some of the fundamental um, work we discuss, uh, how it relates to other more diverse populations, but we simply have no evidence sometimes, and then we raise that. Uh, because this, of course, is an, is an issue uh, that we should address as a field. Our tradition of psychological science is very Western-based. Um, one could argue, arguably state that it kind of started with, let's say, Freud, probably a little bit earlier, but uh, the, the traction for psychology as a science um, developed so late 19th century early 20th uh, and is very much Western oriented, I would say. So the theorizing, the ideas, the research, etc., developed mainly in Western industrialized, rich democratic countries, as they are called weird countries. Um, so weird stands for Western educated, industrialized and rich Democrats. Um, and None, but nonetheless, I mean, lots of countries, lots of lots of cultures, lots of diverse populations have lots of ideas about human uh, behavior and the psychology behind it. Um, but we have generally tended to give not give that uh, a lot of uh, attention. And you could say, well, that's maybe because they haven't been doing science for a lot for for uh, on the psychology uh, for a long time, but neither has Freud. Uh, but we keep referring to him anyway. So <laughs> so why is this psychologist slash philosopher uh, on human behavior? Why does he get so much traction and attention, whereas uh, others don't? Um, and it's difficult to find these others outside of the Western realm because there is no uh, format, there is no narrative, there just, we didn't look that way. Uh, it's, a, it's a big black hole. And uh, this is unfortunate because we can learn a lot from each other and a lot from, uh, from each other's ideas, but we um, have not really engaged on that level. Now, of course, psychology as a field of science has been uh, growing uh, in a lot of countries, also African countries, Asian countries, and um, these voices do get more and more uh, attention and published, uh, but there is still quite a gap, uh, quite a knowledge gap. So um the richer countries have more and better access to uh, research articles for example journals uh, then there's the access to a network um, um they don't have that much money to fly all over the world uh, to join a conference for example and to present their work to engage with other scholars um and to have a voice uh, in our science. And I think this is partly what is referred to as decolonizing our science is that we should open these structural borders that exist within our science. Uh, and we've tr been trying to do that, but that goes beyond the scope of a book, of course, although we do raise these issues um, uh, in the book uh, at regular, uh, regular uh, intervals. If I'm correct in remembering in the social chapter, there's a discussion on the fundamental attribution error, um, which actually isn't that fundamental at all, uh, but mostly concerns people in individualistic uh, countries um, or where independence and self-reliance is uh, often takes center stage is very important, but more interdependent uh, collectivist cultures show less of a 
fundamental error. Uh, so that's why we now tend to call it the correspondence bias. Um, and I think it's a good kind of um, example of where we thought we were looking at fundamental uh, human uh, biases, but then noticed that actually um, some of the ways that we function is very much uh, formed and informed by the culture that we um, grow up in, uh, the culture that we live. And um, uh, the bigger picture boxes gave us the opportunity to discuss this um, uh, and sketch a broader um, uh, picture mm -hmm. of the um, narrative. This is definitely has been a, a, an interesting and I think good first step also for us to sometimes see relationships between constructs and the importance of, um, of diversity um, when trying to understand psychology in a more broader perspective.